So I'm going to explore just to really think this through as we explore these various topics in this context. How do you handle, you know, flawed times? Do, you, do your actions change? Do your patterns change? You know, some people a certain way, but things get tight. You know, they say it's like a tea bag. You know, when you heat it up, then you see what's really going on. But First Chronicles chapter number 29. Let's look at verses 1 through 5. It says, Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, My son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great, because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now for the house of my God, I have prepared with all my might, gold for things to be made of gold, silver for things of silver, bronze for things of bronze, iron for things of iron, wood for things of wood, onyx stones to be set, glistening stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones and <clears throat> marble slabs in abundance. Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver, 3,000 talents of gold of the gold of fur and 7,000 talents of refined silver, silver to overlay the walls of the houses, the gold for things of gold and the silver for things of silver for all kinds of work to be done by the hands of craftsmen. Who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? So David kind of laid down a gauntlet to the people, the leaders and all those who were following him. He said, give me the backdrop for those who aren't familiar. David, of course, is the king who replaced Saul when Saul displeased the Lord. Saul was the first king of Israel and really the second because God Almighty was their king. But they were determined to have a human king because everybody else had one. How many of us had to have something because everybody had one? But he gave uh, all of these treasures to his son Solomon, who was going to replace him as king, because he's older now. Um, and God had told him he wasn't going to build a temple, even though his yearning and his heart's desire was to build a temple. God said he was not going to allow him to build a temple because he had so much blood on his hand. You know, David was a man of war, not to mention it, and all that, but he was always in battles. So God determined not to have him build a temple, but his son. So here he's saying, I've given all that I have. And he said, I went into my personal stash. I pulled out my own gold, my own silver. He had been amassing all kinds of onyx stones, all kinds of things to use to build this beautiful edifice to the Lord. And then he turns to the people and said, will you consecrate yourself to God? In other words, I've given everything. One of the things that stands out for me when you look at David's heart, and this is in part, I'm sure, why God calls him a man after his own heart. And in addition to his willingness to always fess up when he knew he messed up, he had a heart for God. He was he wrote most of his psalms. He he loved the Lord. And he says um, in verse three, moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. And your affections, where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. In other words, what are your affections set on? Because that's oftentimes a good clue as to what you value and what you uh, seem to think is most important for you to feel good about yourself, feel secure, so to speak. Um, they all kind of run together. Here, David is saying, I set my affection on God, on, on building this wonderful temple for his presence to dwell here. What are we setting our affections on? What is our most important thing? Where, where is our heart? He gave above and above beyond because that's what he valued. That's what he wanted to do to honor God. And, and hang in here with me because we want to explore this from a couple of different angles. But the first is, where are you storing your treasures? Where are you investing your time, energy, talent? 
where have you set your affection? Some of us have very little invested in the kingdom of God. We take, we receive, but we give little. You know, it's always uh, interesting because oftentimes the people who I find to be the most demanding are the people who put in the least. And it's not just the financial, of course, but themselves. They're not invested, but they have high expectations of what they're supposed to get when they walk into the house of God. Like everything should just be perfect because y'all are God's people. But these things don't just happen automatically. They happen because God blesses us to be a blessing. And we have to be willing to allow God. He didn't have to pour all that he had and go into his own personal and give above and beyond. That reflected what he valued. I challenge you to look at yourself. Where are your values? What is your heart set on? Where are your affections? Are they just on your bank account? Are they just on your kids, your clothes, your house, your shoes? Where, if, if my old bishop parent, my former pastor used to say, I can tell you what you value. Just show me your checkbook. Well, nowadays, most of us don't write checks, but if we looked at the bank account, debit cards, the credit cards, we know what you value. David valued building the house of God, pouring into the things of God. Look at verse number six through nine. He challenged the people in verse five. Who then is willing to consecrate himself of this day, this day to the Lord? Then the leaders of, and of the father's houses, leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands and of hundreds, with the officers over the king's work, offered willingly, not grudgingly, as Paul said in, in uh, Corinthians, what is it, 2 Corinthians 9, he said, don't give grudgingly. You know, we only want you to give willingly. If you're going to give grudgingly, God is saying, no, don't, don't, we don't want you doing that. But they willingly offered. They gave for the work of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold. 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord, into the hand of Jehiel, the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced, for they had offered willingly, because with a joy, joyful heart they had offered willingly. Pardon me, with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord. And King David also rejoiced greatly. Because God had given them such a joy from being able to pour into his kingdom, pour into his heart, they did it joyfully. They were loyal with a loyal heart. That means they were just like their leaders were. They loved and enjoyed coming into the things of God. You know, I was I was messed up yesterday. I went to church. I I um, just got so blessed by the service and I was boom when I went for the service. So I got myself together. I was like, okay, let me straighten my face. I go to the bathroom, try to clean up my face. How about come back and boom some more? I was like, okay, this is just it's a done deal. Just accept it. <laughs> But I was so moved, not only for the worship, but seeing so many souls come to Christ just filled me because that's where my affection is set. That's where God's heart is set. That's why Jesus died, that he might seek and save that which was lost. Where are your affections? I challenge you to really examine that and be real with yourself and find out what are you investing your heart and your treasure in? Because at the end of the day, you want your life, I hope, to be in alignment with what God desires, with what God's heart is along with. God was rejoicing as they were rejoicing. God was pleased as they were pleased. But their hearts willingly, notice that, you don't do it to impress anybody. You don't do it to uh, prove anything to any human. They gave willingly. But look at verse 10 through 14. 
Therefore, God, David blessed the people before all the assembly. And David said, blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our father forever and ever. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is whose? It's yours. David understood. I'm blessing you and celebrating you, but it's yours anyway. Everything in earth, on earth belongs to God. Everything in heaven belongs to God. And you are exalted as head over all. Hold on right there, as Pastor would like to say. Put a pen right there. Why? If your security is in God, you understand that everything in here, in the earth, the earth is the Lord's and the forest there. You are not panicked and afraid and anxious. You're trusting God in every situation that you find yourself in, whether it's at work, whether it's in your family, whether it's in your finances, whether it's in your physical well-being, whatever it is, your mental health, you trust in God because it all belongs to him. You belong to him. We are the sheep of his in the word of God says. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want in Jesus' name. We shall trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in uh, horses and chairs, but we trust in the Lord. So because I trust that it's all his, if you ever had somebody that loved you in your life, your father, your mother, your cousin, Google them, your uncle, your aunt, grandma, somebody that really cared about you, and you know they know you have a need, you don't stress much because you know they're going to look out for you. Yeah, be, you know, you ever been with somebody and they ain't got no money, like, I want to go get something to eat, but I ain't got no money. You say, look, I got you. God's got you. I need you to pat yourself on your chest and say, God's got me. God owns it all. And I'm trusting him to provide whatever I need. Therefore, I don't have to be afraid. Therefore, David, David could be generous. Therefore, those people could give willingly, knowing that the God owns it all. So with the confidence that David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, we can all say that as well, knowing who he is and that he owns it all. Okay? Let's keep reading. Where was I? Verse 12. Both riches and honor come from you. Somebody up in here want to be rich. I ain't mad at you. That's your desire. But rich where? By going out and hustling? Rich by sowing into the kingdom and trusting God to bless you and save you? I'm always blown away. Sometimes people walk up front and talk to pastor. And they be like, oh, I tied 30,000. Now, I don't know that you need to tell everybody that. that I'm not going to touch their motives. That's on them. My point is to tie 30,000, what does that mean your check was? Because of the faithfulness of people, God says in his word to the faithful, he shows himself faithful. Not only does he show us faithful in the things that are intangible, peace and joy and love and comfort and contentment, he blesses us financially as well. But the point is, they do it, hopefully, out of a pure intent and a desire to just give God what's due him. He says, both riches and honor come from you. You want your boss to honor you, you want your family to honor you, whoever, friends, neighbors, whatever, you want God to bless, recognize where it's coming from and give him to Honor him. Bless him. As David did. David honored the Lord. Not only with his, with his word, he acknowledged God. It's all you. How many of us talk about me, mine, and I, and me? And, like, I did this. I can't take credit. I thank God for anything I've achieved because I know it's nothing but his grace that brought me thus far. He says, in your hand is power and might. In your hand is to make great and to have and to give strength to all. Ooh, how many need great uh, strength right now? How many feel weak right now? How many feel like you can't take another step sometime? I've been there and done that. He makes great. He exalts. 
humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and what? He will lift you up. But I found if you don't humble yourself, he will bring you down because a Holy Spirit goes before a fall. So it's better to let him exalt you and not yourself. Promotion doesn't come from the north, the south, the east, or the west. I mean, the, the, the south, the east, or west, but it comes from the Lord. When we trust God, knowing that he can make us great. We don't have to go around bragging, trying to impress anybody. We be who we are in Christ, and God will give you a great name. He will give you favor with man. He will give you opportunity, open doors that no man can shut. Because you put your faith and your trust in him. I exalt him. Blow him up. Bless him. Speak of his goodness. Speak of his might. Give him all the due and the honor. And watch and see. Won't God honor you and bless you? But he says he gives strength to all. I can't get past that because Lord knows if I'm going to ask you. And I'm thanking you that you give me strength right now. Can I get a witness up in here, up in here? God is faithful. When I'm weak, what did Paul say? He is strong. So we rest in him today. Verse 13 says, now therefore our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so is this? He's like, who are we? We got all this blessing to be able to pour into your treasury to build your house. For all things come from you, great God of Zion. All things come from you, Lord. Say that with me. All things come from you, Lord. Let's say it out loud. Unmute yourself. Oh, all things come from all things come from you, Lord. So why am I going to press about it? Why am I going to be anxious about it? Why am I going to worry about it? If I follow your program, if I do what you ordained for me to do, then you're going to do who be who you are. I love that song Anthony wrote for the play. Even when I was still jacked up, you knew I was going to mess up. You were still gone. Lord, have mercy. You still love me. You still treated me. Even when I wasn't right, even when I didn't do what you asked of me, you still who you were. And I thank God he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. I see a hand, but I don't know. It's got a phone number. Put, put, that, put your name in the chat, darling, because I don't know who that is. I can't see your name. All I see is a phone number. And put, if you have a question, put it in the chat. We're going to come back to you. Okay. So when we recognize that God has dominion over us and over everything, we then have a different posture when it comes to things. We have a different posture when it comes to how we handle our time, how we do our resources, how we handle whatever God has blessed us with because we recognize it's his. Our posture should be like this. Put in whatever you want, take out whatever you want because it all belongs to you. Um, what did we say last week? We're stewards over it. We don't own it. We get to be stewards. We get to be the managers. But it all belongs to him. It all comes from him. So when you're feeling discouraged or feeling like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to make ends meet, remind yourself, it all comes from God and God got me. I'm his. He's not going to leave me or forsake me. I don't have to worry. Because my father owns it all. Imagine if you were the daughter of Bill Gates. You don't have to sit there worrying about dinner. You know he got you covered. Your daddy owns more than Bill Gates. He owns Bill Gates. Come on, somebody. When you rest in knowing that, then you don't have to be anxious about things in the name of Jesus. God has dominion over everything. All right? Let's keep reading. 
verse 15 says, for we are alien and pilgrims before you, as were all our fathers. Our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope. Oh, Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand and is all your own. Great God. If I could take that and hammer it into your head, pour over my head and pour it in. Everything we give you, God, you own. Who are we? Look at it again. Verse 15, we are aliens and pilgrims. This is not our permanent home. This is not our permanent residence. We're aliens. You know, you watched another Aliens ET and all kind of alien movies where they just show up from some other place. Well, guess what? You're in Christ Jesus today. That means you're seated at the right hand of the Father. You're in Christ today. That means that this is not your home. We're pilgrims. Pilgrims are passing through, sojourning through. We are not permanently living here. We're not uh, residents who will abide here forever. We are just going through. And if we knew that, imagine if you rent a townhouse, you rent a house, you rent an apartment, you realize you just pay your rent, but you don't own the place. That's how we should be viewing everything that we have because it belongs to God. So when we are good stewards, we follow the program that he set before us. But this is something I don't want us to miss. We rest in it. We don't have to be worried and anxious even when we don't have a lot. When I left my law practice to go become a chaplain, my Salary took a serious nosedive, like serious nosedive. We had just bought a house. My husband was looking at me like I was crazy. But I said, well, talk to God because I'm not the one who came up with this plan. What's the point? I didn't have the money to go buy every pair of shoes I want. I didn't have the money to go buy the dresses that I wanted all the time. Matter of fact, I rarely bought much for myself. But the God that we serve is faithful. We never went without food. We never missed being able to pay our mortgage. God kept us. My husband was diligent. He worked hard. I thank God for his sacrifices of working to keep things going. Because I wasn't making a tremendous amount of money. I'll be honest with you. But I was marveling at how often God might do something special. Like touch somebody's heart to bless me with this or that. I remember one time this lady asked me, what size shoe do you wear? And I told her. Next week she came to work church. Well, bag, like a big old bag full of shoes. I've confessed this before. My name is Letty. I'm a sure hunger. <laughs> Seriously, God will more in your behalf as you honor him and do what he asks you to do. I will say this, even when things were tight, I still tied, still gave what God asked of us, which is 10%. He said, test me in this and see when I open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so many blessings you don't have on your priest. There's very few places you can see scripture where God says, test me. Because the word of God said, don't put the Lord of God to a test. But in this instance, he invites us in Malachi, test me and see. And I found him to be faithful. He will rebuke the devourer, the word of God says, on your behalf. When you trust him to take care of you and you do what he's asked you to do. He said, bring the whole time. Remember that. You take the 90. And then I stretch the 90 to make it look like 110%. Just like the fish in the loaves. It looked like it could only go but so far, but God has a way of making the little go a very long way. And you do it this way. And you put it in his hand. Amen. So we determined that what? We are not permanent residents. 
we are so, sojourners. We are mere tenants. We rent that we don't own. And we should treat what we have that way and treat it as though the landlord, the true owner, is Almighty God and therefore has a right to do what we want. Because a landlord can do it. They can withhold services to you. Let's look at verse 16. We saw everything we have belongs to God. Now, I read verse 16. Let's go to 17. I know also, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now with joy, I have seen your people who are present here to offer willingly to you. David gives us an insight, right? He, he says, God tests the heart. You know, God says he never tempts anyone. He says, That's not, he's not in a temptation business. But he will try your heart. What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, if God is trying my heart. To try means to examine, to prove it. In other words, test it out. You know, if you take a diamond to a jeweler, they should be able to look at it and, and scratch it on a piece of glass and it'll cut that glass. They can try it. They can prove that it's what it says is purporting to be. To test, to prove, to try of gold. You know, they have a little test. They take some and drop it and then they scratch the gold. If it's real gold, it's some kind of special color that'll show. But if it's not real gold, <laughs> you'll know right away. They can prove it. They can test it. God can test your heart. That's what God does to see what's really in there. Is, you, is it just lip service? You know, he told the Israelites through the prophet Isaiah, he said, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Mercy. We don't want to be a people that God can say that to. We want our heart and our lips to be in alignment with honoring him, with trusting him, with believing him. If he owns it all, what do I have to be afraid of? What can man do to me as the word of God says? I trust in the Lord. That doesn't mean everything's going to be sunshiny and bright all the time. I, I've had my share. Of, uh, as the psalmist says, I've had some weary days. I've had some hills to climb. But all my good days outweigh my bad days. So I won't complain. But God has been good to me. Thank God Almighty. He's been faithful. He's been good to me. So when I know who he is, in spite of what others might say, oh, she crazy. She left her job working as a lawyer. She could be making all that money to go be with those people in prisons. You know, they said all kind of crazy stuff about me. But God honored my decision to follow him. And how many know I wouldn't trade this ride for the whole world? I'm just grateful that I got to be on board with him. Who am I, as David said? So God is looking for what? Our uprightness. He wants us to walk in uprightness in our heart. He delights in that. That means he's taking pleasure. And if I can test you, Job, now, Job, we don't want to take Job's role, Lord. We thank you that he gave us that example. <laughs> but Job, I can let Satan take everything, your health, your children, your money, your cattle, everything. Because I trust you that much that you'll still honor me. That you won't, like your wife said, curse God and die. But she, like he said, woman, are you foolish? God's been good. What he gave, he take away. I came in the world with nothing. I'm going out with nothing. When we trust God, we stand on his word, and we walk in uprightness. And I ask that question, what do you do when things are difficult? Do you start cutting corners, taking shortcuts to get what you want because things are a little tight right now? You're going to be consistent and honor his word regardless. Because you don't want God to start being sometimey. I know I sure don't. What does it mean to be upright when he 
Tessa of rightness, our straightness, our evenness. Are we going to be the same today like him? Are we going to be consistent? Are we going to walk the straight and narrow way, the way he would have us to? Are we going to do our own thing? Watch this. God does not waver. There is no shadow of turning with him. As I say, he's the same what? Yesterday, today, and forever. How many want God to be sometime? You pray and sometime he feel like listening and sometime he don't. I don't want that kind of God. Why would, I, why would he want that kind of child? Why would he want that kind of servant? He wants somebody he can depend on. You know, just like you go to work, there's certain people your boss know of. If they tell me they're going to do it, I know it's going to get done. And then there's others they're like, mm, maybe. We want to be a people who God can delight himself in. Follow his example. Be that upright, that proven, that tested person. Just like Jesus. They did all that they did to him. And what did he say? He could have said, Father, bring down tents, loose every angel in heaven, wipe these jokers out. But no, that's not what he said. Some of y'all might have said that. <laughs> Some of us might have said that. But no, he said, Father, the same way he talked to that lady when he was standing down, kneeling and writing on the dirt, where are your accusers? Neither do I accuse you. He came to save the world, not to condemn it. So his same forgiving way when he walked to her was the same forgiveness he operated in in the worst day of his life. He was still forgiving. He was still kind. He looked out for his mother. Boy, watch out for your mother. Mother, that's your son. Even at my worst hour, God wants my uprightness. How many of us have failed that test before? Like I put up all my hands and toes and everything else. I've messed up before. I'm not perfect. But Lord Jesus, I'm striving to yield more and more to you so that I look more and more. That's my goal. Is that your goal today? Because if it is, then put your up. Affection on pleasing God. Set your heart on it. When you pursue something with all your heart, then you'll obtain it. If you're half-hearted about it, then the likelihood is, is the results are going to be half-hearted. But when you put your whole heart into it, when David Phelps won, what, eight gold medals or some ridiculous amount of gold medals, it was because he got up every morning, 6 a.m., 5 a.m., swimming, practicing, perfecting. He didn't just half-heartedly say, hope I do all right when I get to the Olympics. No, he worked hard. He put his whole heart into it. How much more is it worthy to do that in pursuit of God, which gives far greater benefits? So let's look at it. Some of you, again, we've been talking about the exiles coming back. When the exiles, from, let me back up, when the Israelites were taken into captivity, he allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come and take them away. And the prophet Jeremiah said, oh, you're going into captivity. Even though the king and those who were in leadership didn't want to hear it, they threw them in the dungeon, they did all kinds of things. But you can't change the message just because you try to discount the message. So they went into captivity. Nebuchadnezzar carried him off to Babylon. He told him, after 70 years, you'll come back. And after 70 years, they began to come back. And one of the first tasks they had to complete was to rebuild the temple because the temple had been destroyed. That All that money that David put into that temple, all that gold and silver and all that didn't happen. Say, it got stripped away, stolen, taken, burned down. It was just horrible. Because of the people's disobedience, the Lord allowed it. Let's look at the book of Haggai. Haggai was the prophet who God used to speak to the people of God when they came back. If you've been again reading the word the day that I've been writing, you know the series we've been dealing with in Ezra. Ezra talked about how 
when the people came back and started building the temple, initially they stopped because the people who opposed them wrote to the king that was currently the king when they started rebuilding the temple and said, look at the records. These people's history, they, they got a record of being you know, disobedient, basically, and rebellious. And I thought about that thing. How many of us don't want our record to be the thing that people look at? You know, yes, I used to be that way, but I'm not that way anymore. But some people won't let us off the hook. Some people want to keep us in the same bondage. Oh, yeah, she used to be real this and real that. And she was that and she did this. And, and they keep throwing that back in our face. But God's word lets us know that God keeps no records of wrong. But in this instance, the way they got the king to turn against the people who were coming back to rebuild the temple was to say, go back and check the record. They have a record of being uh, rebellious. So they, the king looked and said, yep, you're right. Stop building that temple. So the people stopped. Even though they had information that they could have sent to the king, they didn't do it for whatever reason. So Haggai went to them and said, it's time to build the temple again. Let's look at it. Hey God, and look at the first chapter of Hey God, and then look at verse number two. How are we doing? Let's see. Okay. Hey guys, chapter one, verse number two says, I'm going to start from verse one. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Hagar, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people, saying, This people says that time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. In other words, the people were like, It's not time yet. We tried, we got discouraged, we we can't do it right now. Then verse three, then the word of the Lord came by Hagar the prophet, saying, It is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? And this temple to lie in ruins. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have so much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages and put to put into a, a, a bag with holes. In other words, you're making money, but you ain't keeping none of it. You're losing all of it because you're not you're not doing what I've asked you to do. You're neglecting my house while you build your own. You're not sowing into my kingdom, but you're sowing into your own little kingdom. And so while you think you're getting ahead, you're still hungry, you're still broke, you still don't have what you need. And you're saying it's not time to get, build the temple. That's what they're telling one another. Verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build a temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, it blew away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins. While every one of you runs to his own house, therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew and the earth withholds its fruit. For I call for a drought on the land and the mountains on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. Sometimes the difficult times the that we have, sometimes those are God's hand at work trying to get our attention. God says, are you building your little empire and ignoring my kingdom? He has a way of getting your attention. Great God is I. And you don't want to be in a posture where you got to wonder about that. Is it God? Is it the devil? You want to know I'm walking in the purpose God has given me as best I know how. 
I'm sowing into God's kingdom. I'm tithing. I'm doing the things that he's encouraged me to do in his word. I'm giving up my time, my talent, my resources. And therefore, I go to him when difficulties happen. But sometimes he will use those things to get our attention, to test us, to prove us, so that we get our heart in the right place. So they, he's saying, you you brought it all home, but it's blown away in your face. And he caused the heavy uh, the drought. He caused the land and the mountains and all that to dry. Verse 12 says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, Zadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord God their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord. And close their God. So when they began to really yield, they say, you know what? God is prompting my heart to move. And they obeyed. And if you've been following again on some of the things that I've been sharing on the word of the day, you find that they went back and rebuilt, started rebuilding after they had stopped the first time. And this time when the people opposed them, they sent a letter of their own to the new king and said, well, check the record and you'll see that the king who sent us back out of exile gave us authority to rebuild. And they looked in it. So the timing was determined by God. That's what we saw in verse four. Sometimes we think we're in control, but God has a plan for our lives. So when you hear his voice, when you feel his nudging and him prompting your heart to do a thing, do it. Not because you agree or think it's the perfect time. You know, when they, when the Lord was telling me to go be a chaplain, I'm like, Lord, we just bought a house. We got a baby. Da, 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 da. I had a million reasons why it was not the time. My husband's an accountant. He's like, let us plan it out. Let us do this. All that sounded great. So you know what I said? That's wonderful. Go talk to God. Then come back and tell me what he said. Because if he says it's not the time, then so be it. I'm not mad. I will stay or go give me a different job. But if he says it's the time, then you're going to have to work that out with him. When God determines it's the time for you to do when God determines this is how I want you to operate, do what he says. It's important to him that his house is built. In other words, that we so into building the things of God. How many of us have grown up in churches and, and they're all in disarray? Some of them have shut down because there's no resources in the house. But if the people of God who feed at the house, would serve at the house, would so into the house, there would be no reason that there wouldn't be meat in his house, as he said in his word. So we saw that in verse 8. And then when you don't do it, there's consequences. Like I said, your pockets are like they got holes in. You put the money in the bag, but it falls out. When we're outside of God's will, sometimes the hardships and the challenges we're dealing with are him trying to shake us up and say, you are not building my kingdom. You are not operating according to my will. You are not walking in the time of the upset. I've called you and you keep saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to get my stuff together. I'm going to come. I'm going to come. But no, when God says the time is right, that time is right. It's not for you to reason it away or try to convince him to do it his, your way. It's for you to align with his way and his timing. And that's when the blessings flow. More importantly, that's when the peace of your soul, when I walked into that stinky, dirty prison, a peace shrouded me like I can tell you I've never experienced in my life. Everything in there should have not made sense for me to have peace. It stank. People, you know, were doing all kind of crazy stuff. Some were nasty, some were mean, some were godly. But it was not a place you would walk in and say, oh, this is a place to have peace. 
But I'm telling you, when I walk across that threshold and that clanging thing slam behind me, I remember, oh God, I've locked it in too. A piece that I've never, you talk about a piece that surpasses all understanding. The Holy Spirit met me right there. When you get in agreement with God, he'll take care of the rest. Like I said, we didn't have zillions of dollars, but we never went hungry. God is faithful. And he will bless you as you honor his will. And do what he says, not when you get ready to. So we're coming down the home stretch. Bear with me, bear with me, bear with me. So we see, look in 113. It says, I am with you, says the Lord. He is with you. He asks you to do something, go somewhere, give of yourself, give of your resources, sow into his kingdom. He is with you. He holds it all. If I'm walking with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the maker of heaven and earth, what do I have to fear? Nothing. What do I have to be afraid of needing? Nothing. Because if I'm walking in step with the Spirit, He will provide. He is with me. I don't have to be afraid. He owns everything. Look at chapter 2, verse 8. We saw this in chapter 1, but he keeps saying it over and over, and there's a reason. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, everything you think you scrambling to get, I own it already. So why won't you just come to me and let me direct your path? Let me make you great. Let me strengthen you instead of you trying to do it yourself. He owns it all. And watch this. He says that we make up the temple. We are the people of God who He's looking to, to represent him in the earth. It used to be that temples were made out of physical beings. Yes, we come together and worship in churches and temples, if you will. But God's word says, you now are the temple of Almighty God. Look with me real quick. This is our last scripture. Go to, back, go to the New Testament. Look in Ephesians 2, 20 and 21. We coming down the home stretch. Ephesians 2. It says, this says, I'm going to start from Verse 19, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being a chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. We are the bricks and the structure that make up the holy temple of God. We belong to him. So not only do we want to take care of his house in the sense of the church we go to, but we want to take care of his house. We want to build up his house. If we are all a part of it, being fit together to build up his temple, then wouldn't it behoove us to make a priority out of building the people of God, building up the house, the temple of God, taking care of not only the physical nature of our being, but the spiritual well-being of the house of God so that we can operate and be a temple that God can be glorified in. When we uh, think about that, let me turn real quick, just in case you might be one of them people who don't know this particular text. I don't want to just be thinking I made something up. If you go to First Corinthians, look at verse chapter six, verse number 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Verse 16, or do you not know that he, oh, that's not what I want. 
da, 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 da. verse 19, pardon me. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are his. So each of us being a small temple, think of it that way, compacted together, make up the glorious temple of Almighty God. So our investment should be in making sure the temples are right. So are you increasing his temple? Not only are you building up the people of God, keeping yourself built up in the things of God, but are you sharing the word of God with others who would then become a part of this great temple? If his priority is the temple, then our priority should be his temple. And then lastly, are you building it financially? If you walk in our church, you'll see some beautiful edifice. I mean, just beautiful. And guess what? None of that was free. That's the tithes and the offerings that have been given and sacrificed so that when people come there, they can come and be comfortable and see the blessings of God. It doesn't just happen. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Where is your treasure? How are you operating? What do you do in your crisis time? Do you dribble up and say, oh, well, I can't do it now because I. Those people who came back from exile, that hey guy told a gold deal, he said, they said it ain't time yet because they didn't have a whole lot of money. They had just come back from exile, they didn't have much. But God said it's time now. And he also said, I own all that stuff you need. So I got you. I'm with you always, as Jesus said, even to the end of the world. So you don't have to be afraid of anything. Rest in your Savior and trust him to help you and provide for everything that you need. When you do what he's called you to do. Amen.